Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to you all. Welcome again. Uh, So we're on the final week, believe it or not, of our September worship series, Inward Change to Outward Focus. Inward Change leading to Outward Focus. Uh, We've been working our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and today we conclude with chapter 5, verses 12 through 24. Uh, These verses in particular contain Paul's final advice to the worshiping community there, uh, at least until he felt compelled to write to them again in uh, 2 Thessalonians, right? This is his final advice for now. But uh, Paul sometimes has trouble uh, letting things lie where they are, as we all know, doesn't he? But if this letter had been his final one to this community here, he would have left them in the best possible position because his concluding advice gives us the best of Paul. We get the best version of Paul in today's reading. Uh, In some ways, it's it's just like classic Paul. Even though it's early Paul, it's classic Paul as well. So uh, I mentioned last week, I talked about this a bit in our message, how Paul sort of evolved over the course of his ministry and that his voice in 1 Thessalonians doesn't quite match his voice throughout all of the later letters and epistles. But here, today, at the end of this letter, he begins to find that voice. It's a joy to see him find that voice. Paul's advice to the people in today's passage could almost be summed up in today's sermon title, which is, Act on What You Love. Act on what you love. So Paul goes on uh, after this letter to speak about love uh, almost constantly, right? Uh, As we all know, he writes and speaks about love all the time. The fruits of the Spirit as well, the fruits of that love. Uh, Famously, he spends several chapters in 1 Corinthians discussing all of these themes. Uh, So I'm going to throw out just a couple names for you today. The first one is Marcus Borg, B-O-R-G, one of my favorite biblical scholars. The second one I'm going to throw out is John Dominic Crossan. I don't know if you've ever heard that name before either. John Dominic Crossan, great, great uh, biblical scholar and uh, 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 scholar of the historical Jesus. Borg and Crossan both view Paul's teaching on love and on the gifts of the Spirit, particularly, particularly these chapters in 1 Corinthians, they view it as an extension of uh, what they call an identity transplant. And specifically for Paul, it's an identity transplant in Christ. In Christ. Um, they actually call Paul, and I've, I've called him this maybe once or twice myself, Uh, they refer to Paul as a Jewish Christian mystic, or a Jewish Christ mystic, rather. Big difference there. Jewish Christ mystic. And uh, they're really interested in this phrase, in Christ, what it means for him to have an identity transplant in Christ. So Paul, to uh, Borg and Crossan, he was a Jewish Christ mystic because he was a Jew in his own mind, and that never stopped, that never ceased but he was a Jewish Christ mystic because of the mystical experience or the conversion experience, as we often call it, that he had on the road to Damascus. We've talked about this a lot the last few weeks, right? He experiences the risen Christ, and it is Paul's identity that gets replaced or transplanted with a new identity, as Paul says, in Christ. So he begins to see Judaism anew in the light of this this identity transplant. His spirit gets replaced with the spirit of Christ. So his old identity gets replaced with a new one. Uh, Another analogy, I mean, a simple simple modern analogy we could think about for this is uh, maybe a heart transplant, right? Modern medical marvel. An old heart being replaced by a new heart. But in Paul's case, it's it's not just about the physical heart, it's about the spirit, right? It's his spirit getting replaced by the spirit of Christ. 
And Paul's commentary on this and his commentary on love as a value, on acting on what you love, is so powerful in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we all are familiar with these passages, right? And now faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. We all learned that at some point in our childhood, and we hope we continue learning it. The love that Paul is talking about is a spiritual gift and an act. It is both a spiritual, it's specifically, it's a spiritual gift that leads us to action, right? So it's not just a, a, something that we decide to do. It's not just good advice for uh, newly married couples, although it is good advice, right? Uh, but it's not only that. It is also a gift of the Spirit. It's a gift that we receive from God and Christ. And for Paul in particular, it is a result of this new identity that he has found in Christ. And, uh, and this is really important too. For Paul, love is the spiritual gift or the fruit of the Spirit that every other gift should be measured against. That gives him something in common with Jesus, doesn't it? Because what does Jesus say is the greatest commandment? To love God and to love your neighbor. But then after that, he says, all the law and the prophets hang on this one commandment. All of the law and the prophets should be interpreted by this one commandment. And for Paul, love is the uh, fruit of the spirit that commands or interprets all of the other ones. So love is kind of like a shorthand for Paul of what a life in Christ is like. Life in the spirit, life that is animated by this identity change. So love is about our relationships, right? And I'm going to talk about a couple things that, that love means to Paul before we get to Thessalonians here. So love is about our relationships, but for Paul and for John Wesley for that matter, our relationships are uh, about our individual relationships, but it's also about our communal relationship as the body of Christ, right? It's about us as individuals and us as a collective. So that means that for Paul, love has a social meaning in addition to an individual meaning. Uh, the, the, probably the, I, I would say maybe the, the strongest or most uh, uh, correct historical Christian term for this kind of social love is justice, right? Justice is a reflection of our communal love for one another, our social life together. It's about, uh, in particular, nonviolent justice, which we've preached about. It's about breaking bread and sharing communion together. And it's about being passers of the peace, which we do every single week. Uh, and a quick little reminder, we will also celebrate World Communion Sunday next Sunday, the first Sunday in October. So hope you can all join us for that. That's Paul's vision of life in Christ. Uh, it doesn't just mean accept the normal way of things that are all around you, accept the injustices, accept A, accept, right? Accept the injustices around you, accept the violence that's around you, but practice love in your personal relationships. We should do that, but it also means that if we are not practicing a kind of social holiness, a kind of justice-oriented holiness that protects other people as well, then we lose sight of what uh, those individual relationships are meant to be like, right? One informs the other. So John Wesley and Jesus and Paul were all passionate about this kind of social and individual holiness as a reflection of God's love. So acting on what we love means acting on behalf of one another in the world. So to, to make this point in a, in a slightly different way, in a maybe a more historical way, uh, people like Jesus and Paul were executed by the state, but they were not executed for simply saying, you must love one another, right? There were people who were threatened by that message. But they were executed because of their understanding of what love meant for the world around them. It wasn't just about individual relationships. It was about the whole 
uh, the whole world, the whole community, the whole time and place in which they lived, right? That's how they ended up ruffling so many feathers. It meant uh, standing against the uh, systems of power that were in place in their time. It meant collaborating with the spirit as it moved through uh, that time and that place. And it stood in contrast to the kind of normalcy and the conventional wisdom that dominated the times that they lived in. So love and justice go together for Paul, and they go together for us as well. Justice without love doesn't really exist, right? Justice without love is just retribution, and love without justice is just individual. It's not communal or social. So love is the heart of justice, and justice is the social form of love. The other thing about Paul's understanding of love that I want to spend a bit of time on before we get to Thessalonians is that Paul came to understand the love of God as something that informed uh, everything around us. It was something that came from Christ, and it was something that sustained and empowered him through all things, even through suffering. God's love abides in all of us, even during times of suffering. So, as, uh, as we've said, as Paul's spiritual life matures and evolves, and it does, we can actually trace that evolution through his letters. As it matures, his conviction about being one with the Spirit of Christ deepens and gets stronger. And he doesn't only write about it in uh, Corinthians and Thessalonians, he famously writes about it in the letter to the Philippians. And the climax of that narrative is in this great, great saying that he has in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ's love sustains us through the storm, right? It sustains us through the storm. So, uh, Statements like this, we sometimes forget how powerful they are. We sometimes forget how deep and real and true Paul's devotion and Paul's discipleship was because of the way that his heart was changed, because of the way that his spirit was changed. And Paul went through so much in his ministry. He's writing letters from prison after years and years of toiling and work, success and failure. He uh, had chronic ill health during this time. And he, he experiences mockery. He experiences stonings, shipwrecks, imprisonments. Paul himself lists uh, all of the perils that he experiences during his ministry in 2 Corinthians. He says, uh, Christ's love sustains him through journeyings often, perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the heathen, perils of the city, perils of the wilderness, perils of the sea, perils among false brethren, lots of perils around him. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, hunger and thirst, fasting, cold and nakedness. Paul's point is that we go through a lot, but the love of God still sustains us. So this is what informs Paul throughout all of his ministry and when he declares that he can do all things through Christ. It's a real world application of the love of God. So, Paul's heart here, Paul's heart is changed as uh, an act of resurrection, as an act of experiencing the living, risen Christ. And Paul witnesses this pattern of suffering and death followed by resurrection and new life all around him. He says in Romans, he says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only creation, but we ourselves but he still believes that we are going to be delivered. He still believes in salvation because that is the power of the love of God. He sees uh, uh, suffering here, Paul, as kind of woven into the process of creation from the start, right? But it also continues. He uses, he uses that vivid metaphor of labor pains, right? This, this, uh, this metaphor of new birth, new creation as well. So we can experience resurrection the same way that Paul did. That's what he wants us to know. And that's another ongoing theme in all of his letters. Without the resurrection, 
And I've, I'm, we've made this point already this series, but I want to reiterate it. Without the resurrection to inform his experience of suffering, Paul would have been, uh, as he writes, afflicted and crushed, perplexed and driven to despair, struck down and destroyed. But as he writes, he is none of these things. He is none of these things because the risen Christ illuminates everything for him. So, you know, the, the, the risen Jesus, there's a powerful connection here between Paul's experience of Jesus and the gospel passages where Jesus uh, uh, leaves the tomb and then shows his scars, his scars to the disciples around him. The scars are how we know that Jesus is real. Scars are in some ways how we know that all of us are real, right? Whether they're, they're physical or emotional scars that we're carrying. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Christ is both crucified and risen, and that's how Paul learns to live and act in the love of Christ, to see it as a present reality. And so, this is why all of his advice, all of Paul's advice, all of his writing, his letters, his epistles, everything, it all comes down to this one piece of wisdom, acting on what We love. So to go to Thessalonians here. Again, we're in chapter 5 today. Uh, Paul begins by uh, repeating a phrase that we heard several times last week in our reading. uh, A phrase that he's used throughout to refer to the community there. Brothers and sisters. He says, brothers and sisters, we ask you to respect those who are working with you, leading you, and instructing you. Think of them highly with love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are disorderly, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong. There's justice again, right? Not retribution, but justice. No one repays a wrong with a wrong but always pursue the good for each other and everyone else. And we'll pause right here. So for Paul, the call for the people to love one another is also a call for them to live in peace and in harmony, to, again, pursue social holiness in addition to individual holiness, big Wesleyan theme, social holiness, and to view their collective life together as a life lived with the communal body of Christ. But as we can see, Paul doesn't stop there, does he? A life lived in the love of Christ isn't just about justice and healing and peace. It is also about celebration and gratitude and joy. And so Paul continues, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation, because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't suppress the Spirit. Don't brush off Spirit-inspired messages, but examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. Avoid every kind of evil. And then finally, I talked about how we, we sort of get more of classic Paul in this closing passage. Finally, Paul ends today with a a sort of old school benediction of the kind we often hear at the end of worship. This is the stuff where we get so many of our own blessings and prayers. This is the kind of stuff that, that makes people say Paul was the founder of the church, right? So it's easy to take it for granted, but Paul deliberately chooses to end every one of his letters and epistles in this way, just as we end our time with a blessing each week. He continues, now may God, may the God of peace God himself cause you to be completely dedicated to him. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at our Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this. So, a little reminder that we need all the time. For Paul, our final salvation our final victory, our final calling is in some ways already taken care of. 
because it is God who is guiding us through everything. It is the risen Christ who has already delivered us into the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And after we remember this, as for Paul, there's nothing left to write. After we remember this, there's little else to say. It is God and God's love that has sustained us. There's so, I mean, there is so much more that we could say, but there's also very little left to say after that. Uh, Paul, you know, Paul always has more to say, so he says a lot more later. But that'll be that for today. So... If you're ever struggling with the state of the world or with the state of the church or with the state of your, your personal life or your family life or your work life or even with your own inner faith journey, there is one tried and true way to reorient yourself, to ground yourself, to soothe yourself. It is the way of Jesus of Nazareth, it is the way of Paul, it is the way of Wesley, and it is the way of the risen Christ. It's what everyone should be doing as a disciple of the gospel. It's what we should all be doing as members of the church. And it's this. Act on what you love. The love of Christ, the body of Christ, the spirit of Christ moves us toward action instead of keeping us passive, and it makes every choice we have in front of us easier if we just act on what we love. Because God is good, because God is grace, because God is found in Christ. The only thing we ever have to do is that. Amen.